Okay, a couple general terms. The term chemotherapy just refers to using drugs to treat an infection. The word antibiotic it means, uh, really just means anything that's against life. Antimicrobial, anything that hurts a microbe. And anti-infective is any agent that reduces or eliminates infection. So anti-infectives are often used for things that are going to be on the surface of something, um, such as Lysol infection, uh, disinfectant spray, or Clorox. One thing to note is that although the word antibiotic is often used to imply antibacterial, that not all antibiotics are in fact antibacterial. However, we're going to keep um, with the colloquial use, which would say that if it's antiviral or antifungal, it's not technically an antibiotic, just so we don't get people confused. Selective toxicity refers to the ability of an antibiotic to destroy target cells without damaging host cells. Sounds pretty simple, right? Destroy the human, or sorry, destroy the bacteria or the virus without destroying the human cell. So, um, whenever possible, what we're going to try and do is we're going to take advantage of differences between microbes in the host cell. So, for example, um, bacteria are prokaryotic whereas human cells are eukaryotic. Prokaryotic means that the bacteria doesn't have a true nucleus. So there's going to be some differences that we can exploit there. Um, another example is cell wall. Um, fungus and bacteria both have cell walls, whereas human cells don't have cell walls. Um, there are certain enzymes that are similar or, or very different from humans, and we can target those enzymes without targeting human enzymes. And then finally, the um, Bacterial protein synthesis is a little bit different. The ribosome structure is different than in humans, and so we can take advantage of that as well. When it comes to the ability to kill bacteria or other microbes, um, we're going to have to come up with a way to describe how well different um, antibacterials work. And so we're going to use this word spectrum. Narrow spectrum antibiotics are going to work on a very small number of bacteria. Others will work on a large variety and we'll call those broad spectrum. So narrow versus broad. Um, susceptible organisms, we have antibacterials, antifungals, antivirals, you can guess what they target. Uh, we can also classify things by the mechanism. Um, do they inhibit enzymes? Do they inhibit the cell wall, etc.? And then we can also have the distinction between bactericidal versus bacteriostatic. Bactericidal are going to kill bacteria outright, whereas bacteriostatic are just going to kind of slow them down and allow the um, body's immune system to clear the infection naturally. Now, it really doesn't matter ultimately whether it's bactericidal or bacteriostatic. Without an immune system, chances are very slim that any antibiotic will work by itself. One other note about bactericidal versus bacteriostatic is that oftentimes bactericidal drugs need the bacteria to be growing actively in order to work. So if you give a bactericidal antibiotic along with a bacteriostatic antibiotic, the bacteriostatic will actually prevent the bactericidal from being as effective because the bacteriostatic will slow down the growth of the bacteria, whereas the bactericidal needs it to be growing in order for it to work. Resistance is the ability of a microbe to not die in the presence of our, our antibacterial or other antimicrobial. Um, there's a concept known as relative resistance and then another called true resistance. In relative resistance, what you've done is you've increased the dose it takes to kill it, but it's still susceptible ultimately if you can get a high enough dose to the bacteria. True resistance, on the other hand, means that no matter what we do, it's never going to work. So that bacteria has truly become resistant to this particular drug. Um, the way that we measure relative resistance is something called minimum inhibitory concentration, or MIC. It's the amount of bacteria on a petri, or sorry, amount of um, the amount of antibiotic on a petri dish that's required to kill or inhibit the growth of antibiotic of our bacteria. When it comes to the mechanism of resistance, there are four basic mechanisms. The first is drug enzymes. So basically, our bacteria is going to produce an enzyme that's going to destroy the antibacterial. The classic example is penicillin. Mold produces penicillin, which inhibits bacterial growth. 
and then some bacteria are going to produce a penicillinase that is going to destroy the penicillin. The bacteria can cease uptake of a drug. In order for the, um, in order for the um, bacteria, antibacterials to work, they have to penetrate the cell wall. And so a lot of times what that means is the bacteria actually actively has to take in the drug. And if the bacteria stops doing that, it'll become resistant. Another is we can have a change in the bacterial receptors. So this is an example of how MRSA works. Penicillin binds to an area that we call penicillin binding proteins. So what the bacteria can do is it can change the shape of those proteins so that the penicillin can no longer bind to it. And that way, no penicillin type drug will ever work on MRSA again. And then finally, we can have um, the bacteria synthesize drug antagonists. So for example, if the drug pretends to be a bacterial protein, let's say PABA, and inhibits protein, um, DNA synthesis, then what our bacteria can do is it can just produce more PABA so that that larger amount of PABA will knock the drug off of the binding site and allow the bacteria to normally replicate. When it comes to how the bacteria becomes resistant in the first place, there's two different ways that it can become um, become resistant. The first is spontaneous mutation. So for example, um, our little bacteria is put into the presence of penicillin, and so it starts to mutate and try and find a way not to die, and it finally comes up with the right way, and now it's resistant to penicillin. So spontaneous mutation pretty much is one drug only. Now, bacteria don't have sex, but they can conjugate. So when they conjugate, what they'll do is they'll come together their um, cell walls will close up and they'll actually exchange DNA. And when that occurs, you can actually get bacteria that have multiple drug resistance because this one over here was resistant to penicillin. This one over here was resistant to SEPTRA. And the two got together and exchanged DNA and now they're both resistant to both drugs. When it comes to factors that influence resistance, there's a couple different things. The first one is the use of antibiotics themselves. Anytime you expose a bacteria or a group of bacteria to a particular um, antibacterial agent, what will happen is a lot of them will die. A few of them won't die, though. And those ones that don't die, sometimes it just was the concentration wasn't high enough. Sometimes they were dormant during that stage. Whatever it is, they didn't die. Maybe they're just in the center and the drug never actually reached them. Those survivors have the potential to become resistant. Um, anytime we use drugs that are narrow spectrum, we don't affect as many drugs, as many bacteria in the body, and so there's less likelihood of there becoming resistance. On the other hand, if we use a broad spectrum, then what's going to happen is we're going to affect a lot of different bacteria in the body all of which are now going to have the opportunity to become resistant to that particular antibiotic, even if we weren't targeting them in the first place. This can lead to superinfections, where we um, eliminate too many good bacteria, and then all that's left is a bad bacteria. And so there's no competition to keep, it, to keep its numbers in check, and so you have an overgrowth in that bad bacteria. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, has what they call a 12-step program to um, eliminate vancomycin resistance in particular, but it really it's for anything. So here are some of the highlights. The first one is immunize. The idea is that if you have patients who are immunized, they're going to get fewer infections to begin with. You're going to need less of the antibiotics. The next one is get the IVs out. The IV is a window, direct window, into the bloodstream, and Anytime you have a patient with an IV, you've got potential portal for infection to get into the patient. The next one is have an infectious disease consult anytime you have a patient with an infection. Um, and this is in the hospital, particularly. Don't just treat a patient with drugs hoping you know what's going on, but actually get a doctor that specializes in it, and they're less likely to make mistakes. That's the idea, anyway. The next one is contamination versus infection. Um, it's extremely common to have patients who actually don't have a true infection. What happened is their culture was contaminated by the person collecting the specimen. Oftentimes that's a nurse, 
nurses have to be very careful, make sure they maintain sterile technique. When you get to tech skills next semester, you're going to find out just how hard it is to actually keep sterile technique. A lot of you are going to break without even realizing it. So you've got to get really good at that very quickly. The next one is colonization versus infection. Colonization means that the bacteria has taken up shop in an area and is colonizing that area. Um, so for example, you could have MRSA that's living in a patient's nose, it's the most common place for MRSA to live, but not causing any problem. There's no inflammation, there's no redness, there's no fever, there's no white, white, white blood cell count. It's just living there, not causing any problem. That's colonization. Generally speaking, you should treat colonization with um, bacterial reduction, um, reduction techniques such as washing washing your hands, using antiseptics, that sort of thing, not necessarily using antibiotics. On the other hand, infection is when you have the area being colonized by the bacteria and you have symptoms. So you need to know both systemic symptoms and local symptoms of infection. The next thing we have is say no to vanco. Just basically don't use vancomycin unless it's absolutely necessary. The one after that is stop when the infection is gone. The only way you're going to know when the infection is gone is to do cultures. Um, in the outpatient world, when we do empiric therapy, we just say, here, take this for seven to 10 days, take this for two weeks, and take it whether you need it or not. When you, as soon as you start feeling better, don't stop taking it. It might not be gone yet. Keep taking that, to keep taking that antibiotic. When we're in the inpatient setting, we shouldn't just go by instinct. What we need to do is actually do cultures, and then when the infection is gone, stop. The next one after that is isolate the pathogen. So, you know, basically, uh, we don't want the pathogen passing from patient to patient to patient, because every patient we pass that to needs to be treated with antibiotics and is another uh, potential um, time where that bacteria has the potential to be become resistant. And of course, that leads us to break the chain and wash your freaking hands. Washing your hands is the number one way to reduce antibiotic spreading in the hospital. It's the simplest, it's the easiest thing in the world, and yet for some reason, it's so hard to do. When it comes to selection of antibiotics, there's a couple things we have to consider. First one is, what is the microbe? Um, ideally, you would want to know exactly what it is. The way we do that is a culture and sensitivity. Um, once we know what it is, we want to know what drugs it's sensitive against. And then you typically would like to use the most narrow drug that's going to work on that particular infection. And then finally, there's host factors. How sick is the patient? Are they immunosuppressed? Do they have a good immune system? Um, is the blood, you know, is the infection in their foot or is it in their bone? Is it in their blood? All those things have to be taken into account. Um, particularly if it's in the brain, you'll need a drug that can penetrate the blood-brain barrier. That goes to site of infection. And then the last thing, uh, the next thing is immune status. We mentioned that briefly. And then something called empiric therapy. Empiric therapy is where you give the patient drugs, specifically antibiotics, without knowing exactly what it is. So if you've ever been to, the to a doctor's office and they're like, oh yeah, it sounds like you've got a bronchitis. Here, have a Z-Pak. That's empiric therapy. We don't know that even, we don't even know that you have a bacterial infection, let alone what the bacterial infection would be but we're giving you a fairly broad spectrum antibiotic, hoping that it will work. Empiric therapy is not an exact science. However, there are some very good rules of thumb. Uh, most of those are compiled together into a little book called the Sanford Antibiotic Guide. It comes out every year and it has um, guidelines for different kinds of infection. So for example, if the patient has sinusitis, the first drug of choice would be Augmentin. If they've had re recent um, antibiotics, then it would be Augmentin high dose. If the patient is allergic to penicillin, then it's going to be maybe a cephalosporin or Leviquin. And then it'll say things like not a good choice would be this other thing. Um, so you, it kind of gives you a little algorithm. And so you just start at the top of the list and you work your way down and prescribe those drugs. And so that's kind of like the, the best evidence of empiric therapy. This is an expansion of the host factor slide from a little bit earlier. Um, so host defense, immune system, skin, that sort of thing. Um, 
how well is the patient able to mount a defense against the against the bacteria? The next thing is the site of infection. Um, does the, the drug have to cross the blood-brain barrier? How much uh, blood flow is there to an area? Infections on the feet are much, much more difficult to treat than infections on the face because there's so much more blood flow to the face than there are to the feet. Um, is it on the heart valves? Could that cause um, the need for a heart valve transplant? Um, is it in an abscess where the antibiotic can only get to the outside, it can't get to the inside of that abscess. In that case, it would need to be drained. Um, just search on YouTube for, um, for incision and drainage of an abscess. Make sure you haven't eaten before you see those. The next one is the patient's age. The very young and very old are more likely to be frail in terms of their health and more likely to have um, problems with infections. Then we have pregnancy and lactation. You know, will the drug cross into the into the uh, placenta? Will it cross over into the breast milk? Will it adversely affect the baby? And has a patient had ever had an allergic reaction or bad um, bad adverse reaction to this particular drug? And then other is the genetic variations. Um, we talked a little bit about those when we talked about the CY, uh, CYP450 cytochrome mitosome, that microsomal enzyme system. And so there's some considerations there with certain um, ethnic groups either being super metabolizers or um, not having enough metabolizing of a particular drug. It might make that drug incredibly toxic for them, or it might make it so a particular drug just doesn't work in that kind of person. Typically speaking, the dosage needs to be four to eight times higher than the mic. Remember, the mic is the minimum inhibitory concentration. Um, duration of therapy, you want to have it long enough so that you kill all the bacteria, but not so long that you cause excess resistance. Um, then you, know, you want to think about combinations. Combinations, you want to have an additive effect or a potentiative effect, where the two together are going to make a stronger antibacterial effect than either drug by itself. Antagonistic, on the other hand, is where you have one drug canceling out the effects of another drug, and we already mentioned why bactericidal and bacteriostatic don't get along that well. Prophylaxis is when we give an antibiotic to prevent an in an infection rather than treat an infection. Some examples would be patients who are going into surgery. A lot of times we'll give them an antibiotic ahead of time to reduce the amount of bacteria that could potentially cause problems after the surgery. Another example would be in a patient that has um, heart valve defects, we will, might give them um, antibiotics before they undergo certain procedures such as dental procedures because um, the dental procedures could cause bacteria to enter the bloodstream, not a lot, but a few. And then with because of the heart valve defect, it gives the bacteria a chance to actually take hold inside the heart and cause bacterial endocarditis. Another example would be a patient that has neutropenia, which is a type of white blood cell that kills bacteria. If, if the neutrophils are low, so penia means low, so if neutrophils are low, that patient might be immunosuppressed and could be at risk for infections. So those are some of the most, more common scenarios where you're going to see antibiotic prophylaxis. These are some factors that are known to increase antibiotic resistance. The first one is the, attempt, the attempted treatment of an untreatable infection. So for example, the patient has a common cold, but their concerned mother just won't leave the doctor's office until they get something. And so they finally get a prescription for an antibiotic. On the other hand, you have a physician who, well, they came to me and I'm charging them good money, so I've got to make it look like I'm actually doing something, even though there's nothing I can actually do for them other than reassure them. So both of those result in inappropriate prescriptions for antibiotics. Next is we have treatment of fever of unknown origin. So and in the outpatient world, if a patient has a fever, chances are you're going to give them some Tylenol or some ibuprofen. In the hospital, you give them ceftriaxone. So that's one example. Um, another is giving a dosage that's too low. So what you're going to do there is you're not going to actually get rid of the of the infection, but you're going to give that bacteria a good chance to get some resistance going on before you treat it later on.
treatment in the absence of adequate bacteriologic information. What that basically means is empiric therapy. And then the last one is the omission of surgical drainage. If you have a large collection of bacteria in an area, a collection like an abscess, there's no way that the antibiotic can penetrate all of that. And after surgery, fluid will accumulate in pockets, and so you've got to drain that. If you don't drain it, it becomes breeding ground for antibiotics. Sorry, for bacteria. When we give patient antibiotics therapy, we'd like to see that they get better. So one thing you can do is check the fever. The fever should go down, um, not necessarily at first, but within a day or two, it should start going down. Um, you want to have resolution of signs and symptoms. So if they have chills, if they have muscle aches, if they have a rash, you want to see those sorts of things going down. Um, you can check the serum drug levels. So you can check to see if they're um, therapeutic or not. And then you can also check cultures. And ideally in the culture, what you're going to get is you're going to get fewer and fewer colony forming units until there's nothing at all. All of this next group of drugs are going to work in a similar manner. That is that they're going to weaken the cell wall of bacteria. We're going to divide this um, group of drugs into three major categories. The first one is beta-lactams, and there's going to be four drug types in there. Then we have vancomycin, which is by itself, and tacoplanin, which is by itself. The reason beta-lactam drugs are called beta-lactam is because the active part of the drug, the part that actually damages the cell wall, is called beta-lactam. Now, bacteria are essentially hypertonic, so there's more stuff inside them than there is on the outside fluid. As a result, they have a tendency to want to swell up and burst open. So to prevent that from occurring, they've got this cell wall, which is a rigid layer outside of the cell membrane that prevents swelling. So key thing is we've got the cell membrane on the inside, and then we have the cell wall on the outside, preventing the cell membrane from going and popping open. The basic structure of the, cell, of the cell wall is peptidoglycan polymer chains with cross bridges that hold those chains together. So basically it turns the chains into a net. The net holds the cell together. Um, there's two enzymes that are very important in terms of cell growth. Now because the cell wall is hard, it's going to prevent the um, bacteria from growing larger unless the cell has some way to get rid of those cross bridges and then regrow them again once, once the cell's gotten bigger or divided into two. So the first one is called trans transpeptidases. The transpeptidase is what is the enzyme that allows the bacteria to grow new cell wall. Autolysins are enzymes that allow the bacteria to break down the cell wall so it can grow bigger. Here we have an example. Here we have peptidoglycan chains, and then you'll notice they kind of all go one way. It would be fairly easy for something to slip in between one because nothing keeps it from spreading apart. Once we have transpeptidases, the transpeptidases produce these little cross bridges. So the cross bridges are going to hold the transpeptidases, sorry, going to hold the peptidoglycans together like a net. The way that beta-lectum drugs are going to work is um, when the cell grows larger, autolysins are going to break down these little um, cross bridges. That's going to allow our cell to get to grow larger, and then the transpeptidases will try and reform those cross bridges, these cross bridges. So the way that beta-lactam works is the beta-lactam is going to attach where the bit where the transpeptidase works and inhibit the transpeptidase from working again. That will inhibit the cell, the cell wall from growing back, and that will ultimately kill our bacteria. Just a reminder of some of the differences between the gram-positive and gram-negative um, cell walls and cell membranes. Gram-positive bacteria have a cell wall, and then they have the cell membrane.
So a bacteria would have to penetrate the cell wall to get to these receptors where they want to work. In a gram negative, there's actually an outer membrane. Then you have the cell wall, and then you have the inner cell membrane. So now a bacteria, um, an antibiotic would have to penetrate through the outer wall, through the cell wall, and then get to the receptor. Just a reminder that gram-positive turn purple or blue when you stain them. Gram-negative don't. The reason they don't turn purple is because it's a lot harder for that purple dye to go through the layers of cell membrane to actually get inside this membrane, inside this cell wall here. With the gram-positive, it's easy for that stain to get inside. Here's the basic way that penicillin works, and this actually goes for all beta-lactam drugs, because remember the active portion of penicillin is called beta-lactam. So the penicillin is going to bind to penicillin binding proteins, which are located on the membrane underneath the cell wall. What, um, what the penicillin does when it binds to those proteins is it's going to inhibit the transpeptidases and that's going to result in a weakened abnormal cell wall. It's going to have a cell wall that has fewer cross bridges in it. It will also prevent the, inhibi the inhibition of autolysins. So basically what we're doing is we're making our bacteria grow to death. So remember it has to break down the cell walls so it can grow and then reform it. And what we're making it do is it has, it'll break it down, but it'll never reform. In order for penicillin to work, it must first penetrate the cell wall and second bind to the penicillin binding protein. So that can help you um, see how bacteria can become resistant. One is if they have a cell wall that can't be penetrated. Another is if they can change their penicillin binding proteins, change those receptors that penicillin binds to. And of course, the third way is we could produce an enzyme that breaks down penicillin, but that's not within this little um, part right here. And this slide explains what I just said on the last slide. Um, one last thing, the way that MRSA works, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, is by actually changing the alteration of the penicillin binding protein structure. Most of the time, though, the way that we're going to get resistance to penicillins is one, because of the cell wall, gram negative, or because of enzymes, penicillinases and beta lactamases. Now, why do we call them different things? Why don't we call them just one or the other? Well, before we knew, well, before we had named beta lactam beta lactam, we had called the drugs penicillin. And so, enzymes that break down penicillin are called penicillinase. Later on, we decided, you know what, that little part that actually does the actual work in penicillin, let's call that beta-lactam. And then that's actually going to form the basis for new synthetic drugs that we're going to create. And all of those drugs, if an enzyme can break them down, we're going to call those enzymes beta-lactamases. So, an example of this would be if you have a student who comes to a school and everyone knows their brother. So anyone who knows who anyone who knows the brother, oh, you're so and so's you're so and so's sister. Oh, thanks. But anyone who doesn't know that brother, oh, you're so and so. You know, so um, So the bottom line is there is no there is no difference whatsoever between penicillinases and beta lactamases. It's just how we name them. You know, are we naming you Carol or are you Joe's sister? Same person, just a different way of calling them.
The most common way that we're going to classify penicillins is by their spectrum. So within narrow spectrum drugs, we have two subclasses, ones that are vulnerable to penicillinase and ones that are resistant to penicillinase. So for the ones that are, are vulnerable, there's two different kinds, penicillin G and penicillin V, sometimes called VK. When it comes to the penicillinase resistant, the most famous is called methicillin, and that's the one we're going to talk about. Now, methicillin isn't actually available on the market anymore because it can cause kidney damage, but it got a bacteria named after it, and so we're going to talk about it. Then under broad spectrum, those are sometimes called amino penicillins because they have an amino group on them. And then finally, we have the extended spectrum. These are primarily for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay, we're going to talk about penicillin in some detail. Penicillin G was the very first one discovered. It's bactericidal to both gram positive and some gram negative. It's relatively narrow spectrum, and it is um, vulnerable to penicillinase. So some of the possible uses, you see them there. One thing I am going to mention uh, for, um, in a little bit of detail is strept, uh, streptococcus, yeah, streptococcus pyogenes. Streptococcus pyogenes is a very nasty bacteria. In addition to causing your normal little strep throat, it can cause scarlet fever and bacterial endocarditis and the flesh-eating bacteria, better known as necrotizing fasciitis. The key is, if you don't treat strep streptococcus um, infections, 10% of the time, the patient can get acute rheumatic fever. Now, acute rheumatic fever could cause just an acute fever and nothing else, or it could end up causing things like valve uh, dysfunction, which might need valve replacement surgery, or it could end up causing blindness or rheumatoid arthritis. So it's not something that you want to take chances with, and that's the reason why you have patient, you know, every time you go to the doctor with a sore throat, the only thing they really want to know is, is it strep throat? If it's not strep throat, we're not giving you nothing. But if it's strep throat, we're going to treat you. And the reason why is because of that potential complication. Penicillin G is available in three different forms or salts, potassium, procaine, and benzathine. And they're all a little bit different. Now, none of these penicillin Gs can be absorbed by mouth because they're all inactivated by gastric acid. Um, the potassium salt, so penicillin G potassium, is administered by intramuscular. It's rapidly absorbed. Um, the procaine and the benzathine can last up to a month, but with very low blood levels. Um, and then potassium is the only one that can be given IV. Just read the slide. Interestingly enough, penicillin is one of the least toxic of all antibiotics. Um, most of the side effects are caused by the salt. So, for example, potassium can cause dysrhythmias, procaine can cause some weird behaviors. Now, 1 to 10% of the population is allergic to penicillin. Um, these can range from very mild to life-threatening. Now, you need to have prior exposure before you can become allergic to something, but you don't necessarily need to have actually had penicillin before you can become allergic to it because the penicillin pro, um, the penicillin um, molecule occurs naturally in bread mold. So if you've ever had bread, chances are you've had some bread mold, even if you didn't see it growing, and you could have potentially had ingestion of small amounts of penicillin. Doesn't necessarily do anything to you in those tiny, tiny amounts, but when you take enough to be called a drug, all of a sudden now, you get the other, you get the other. About five to ten percent of penicillin allergies are cross-reactive with other beta lactams. In that case, it's not actually allergic to penicillin, but it's active to the breakdown products of penicillin. Um, because of that cross-reactivity, some doctors are very hesitant to give patients who are allergic to penicillin other beta lactam drugs. Um, so other doctors. It's kind of more dependent on how severe the reaction was.
Now, we recognize three different types of reactions. The first is immediate, somewhere between 2 to 30 minutes. You take the drug, bam, you get, you get symptoms. Then there's what's called accelerated, which occurs from 1 hour to 72 hours, so somewhere between 1 hour and 3 days. And then there's late, which can occur from days to weeks later. And this one can sometimes be a little bit hard to recognize because, you know, you get this weird reaction going on, go back to Dr. Well, if you had any antibiotic therapy, if you had any penicillin, ah, a couple weeks ago, but that probably isn't it, right? Yeah, that's probably not it. You have to actually think about it because you can get reactions up to weeks later. Um, in a very, very small percentage of the time, you can have anaphylaxis. Read the slide. Most important thing on here is verify the reaction. Make sure it's actually an allergy. Okay, penicillin V, sometimes called VK, is basically the same thing as penicillin G, except you can give it orally. Um, you can take it with meals if you need to. You have to take it four times a day. Okay, now we're going to talk about the ones that are resistant to penicillinase. Um, so basically, you take a penicillin molecule, and then you alter it in such a way that penicillinase bounces off of it. So it's kind of like putting on um, a bulletproof vest for the penicillin. Now, these drugs are mostly used for staphylococcus infection because 90% of staph infection nowadays produces penicillinase. Um, so if the patient has staph, you can't use regular penicillin. You've got to use one of these resistant ones. Um, Sometimes, you know, sometimes these would be called anti-staph penicillins. Um, MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, is not resistant because of penicillinase. If it were, then methicillin should work on it. The reason it's resistant is because it's actually changed its proteins. The receptors are no longer the same, so beta-lactam can't bind to that area. So not only will no penicillin ever work, no beta-lactam will ever work on MRSA. Okay, basically by adding amino groups to the, um, to the penicillin G, we can increase their spectrum against gram-negative bacteria. Um, it penetrates the cell wall better, but it's still vulnerable to penicillinase. Um, some examples would be ampicillin and amoxicillin. Amoxicillin is probably the most popular penicillin nowadays in outpatient basis. Amoxicillin is very commonly given for children who have ear infections. If you give amoxicillin a bodyguard called clavunolanic acid or clavunolate, you get something known as augmentin. Augmentin is basically just a drug combination as amoxicillin plus a bodyguard that makes the amoxicillin less susceptible to penicillinase. The extended spectrum kill everything that regular um, amino penicillins kill, plus they can kill some additional gram-negative bacteria such as Pseudomonas enterobacter, Proteus, and Klebsiella. They are vulnerable to penicillinase. And the main thing they're going to use them with in the um, in the hospital is going to be Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You often give them in combination with aminoglycosides, and the more important thing here is don't mix them in the same IV line at the same time, because what will happen is the two uh, drugs will form a precipitate, a rock, inside the IV line. Um, some examples: ticrosylin, piperacillin. Piperacillin is a drug you're going to need to going to need to know for your test. If you combine, if you combine piperacillin with tazobactam, which is a substance that protects piperacillin from penicillinase, then we can, we're going to call that drug combination zosin. So just like amoxicillin had its bodyguard and that became augmentin, piperacillin plus its bodyguard becomes zosin.
So here we have some bodyguards that we can add to penicillins to increase their ability to attack penicillinase producing bacteria. The two that you are going to need to know are augmentin and zosin. Next we're going to talk about a group of drugs called beta-lactams. Beta-lactams are synthetic drugs. They do not occur in nature. Um, what we did was we took the beta-lactam ring which is the active part of penicillin, and then we created a drug around it that is going to be more resistant to beta-lactamase, it's going to be broader spectrum than penicillins, and is going to penetrate the um, cell wall a little bit better than penicillin. So if, um, if a bacteria is resistant to penicillin, then chances are it could be resistant to a cephalosporin. Um, Certain cephalosporins are more resistant to beta-lactamases than others, and we'll talk about that in a minute. There are four generations of cephalosporins, um, and as you go from the first generation to the fourth generation, typically you're going to get more gram-negative activity. So, generation one has very little gram-negative activity compared to generation four. Generation 2 and 3 have a little bit more gram-negative activity as you go down. As you go from the first generation down to the second and then the third generation, you're going to have less gram-positive activity. Now there's a little bit of an exception on this one because when you go back to the fourth generation, all of a sudden you get more gram-positive activity. As you go from the very first generation down to the second and the third and the fourth generation, you're going to have an increased resistance to beta-lactamase. So it's going to be harder and harder to break these drugs down with, with bacterial enzymes. That's going to allow them to treat more and more things and become broader spectrum. As you go from the first generation down to the second, third, and fourth, you're going to have an increased ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. So if you have some kind of central nervous system infection, the drug of choice is not going to be a first or second generation, it's going to be a third or a fourth generation cephalosporin. Um, this line right here where it says only one drug is currently found in the fourth generation is no longer true. There's actually more than one drug now. Again, this 24 number is no longer accurate. There's actually more now. But for the rest of it, it's fine. Just read it. Again, just read the slide. An important thing, anytime you see thrombophlebitis as a possible um, side effect, what you always want to do is add more saline and then give the drug slower. Okay, the first and second generation in the hospital are usually not used for active infections. They're usually going to be used prophylactically. Um, the most common one there is going to be cefazolin or ANCEF, which is a first generation cephalosporin. Um, one gram AMCEF um, IV before surgery is extremely common. When it comes to the third generation, you're going to see these used for a lot of different infections, meningitis, pneumonia, nosocomial infections, all kinds of crazy stuff. In the emergency room, ceftriaxone is especially popular because one dose IM can treat a lot of different things. So if you have a patient who you're not really sure they're going to be compliant with your antibiotic um, prescription, or maybe they're too poor to buy an antibiotic over the counter, whatever it is, you can just give them one shot of ceftriaxone IM and send them on their way. One thing to note about ceftriaxone when it's given IM is that it is extremely painful. A lot of times it's going to be diluted with some lidocaine to make it not hurt as much. The next drug class is called carbapenems. They're basically beta-lactam antibiotics with very, very broad spectrum. They're either IV or IM only, so no PO.
um, and they're used for mixed infections with anaerobes, staph, and gram-negative bacilli. <clears throat> The drug you're going to have to memorize is imipenem. Next, we have the monobactams, which is only one of them, and it's called aztrianum. Um, aztrianum is a beta lactam antibiotic. It's very, very narrow spectrum. It only attacks gram negative bacilli, and it is highly resistant to beta lactamase. Okay, the next drug is vancomycin, and this is the first drug that we're going to talk about that does not contain beta-lactam. Out of all of the cell wall destroyers, the only one that we're really going to talk about as far as being useful used is vancomycin that doesn't have beta-lactam in it. Two main uses for it are MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and pseudomembranous colitis, or C. diff. We'll talk about what that is in a little bit. Vancomycin is very poorly absorbed PO, so you pretty much can't treat any systemic infection with it. Skin infection, um, wound infections, bone infections, nothing like that. You can't treat PO. You've got to use IV. The only time you're ever going to see PO uh, vancomycin being used is when you're trying to treat C. diff. So now let's talk a little bit about what C. diff is. C. diff is short for Clostridium difficile, which is a gram-positive bacteria that grows in about 2-5% to of the population's gut. Um, most of the time, C. diff doesn't cause any problems for normal people. However, if you've been given antibiotic, usually multiple rounds of antibiotics, what can happen is Clostridium difficile is very tough to treat. Um, it's very hard to kill, and when it starts to die off, it turns into spores, so it can still survive. Um, because of that, it's extremely hard to get rid of it. So if you take antibiotics, especially multiple rounds of antibiotics, normal um, gut bacteria can die off, leaving Clostridium difficile as the only last bacteria standing, or whatever it is that bacteria do. That will give it a chance to take over. When it takes over, it's going to cause a disease called pseudomembranous colitis, and it's going to be characterized by a very distinctive odor in diarrhea. Um, so vancomycin can be used to treat C. diff. The other main drug that's going to be used for, to treat C. diff is a drug we're going to learn about later on called metronidazole, or flagyl. The other way that we can treat C. diff is with um, probiotics. Probiotics are good bacteria, and there's two main ways we can get those. One is we can take a drug that has probiotics in it, and the other is we can do a fecal transplant. So um, with fecal transplants, what you're going to do is you're going to take the donor's feces, take a small amount of the bacteria from them, and then you're going to transplant that into the patient's GI tract. Now, you don't actually eat it. What they do is put an, an NG tube in and then put it in through the NG tube. So it goes into the patient's stomach. So you're never going to taste another person's feces in this case, unless you burp. So the two things we're going to use vancomycin to treat are MRSA and pseudomembranous colitis caused by C. diff. When we're treating MRSA, it's going to be IV. When we're treating C. diff, it's going to be PO. Um, vancomycin has a very low therapeutic range, which means it's easy to get from not doing anything to toxic. So we're going to have to monitor blood levels. Um, it can cause ototoxicity, thrombophlebitis, and nephrotoxicity. So um, you got to monitor the levels, and to avoid that thrombophlebitis, we're going to infuse it over 60 minutes. And, like we said earlier, we're going to dilute it in extra fluid. Now, most antibiotics, when you give them IV, come in a little bag that's 50 milliliters. So you're going to give that 50 milliliters over half an hour. When it comes to vancomycin, it's a bigger bag. It's got 100 milliliters in it. And we're going to give that 100 milliliters over an hour. So twice as much fluid twice as long to go in 
when it comes to monitoring blood levels, you give the patient the drug, it comes down and it comes back, you give them the next dose and it comes back down again. The top amount right after you give it is called the peak. The very, very lowest point right before you give the next dose is called the trough. So when you're drawing a trough level, you draw it before the next dose. When you draw a peak level, you draw it right after you give the drug. Basically, take a plan and it's supposed to be better than vancomycin in every way. It works against MRSA, it works against VRE, which is vancomycin resistant enterococcus. There's fewer side effects. You can do an IM, but we're trying to save it. And the reason we're saving it is because, well, what happens if one day vancomycin doesn't work? And the patient's also resistant to tacoplanin. Well, we're trying to save tacoplanin against that day. Okay, next we're going to talk about drugs that inhibit protein synthesis. Okay, tetracyclines are broad-spectrum antibiotics that bind to the 30S ribosomal subunit of the bacterial ribosome and inhibit bacterial synthesis. All of the drugs work essentially the same way and all of them essentially have the same resistance. Um, really the only difference is how long they last. Um, you can see some of the ways that the drug, the bacteria become resistant to them, and you can see some of the things that we'll use tetracyclines to treat. Um, just wanted to mention right here that anthrax is a potential bioterrorist threat. Um, so the treatment for that is going to be a tetracycline type drug. And under other uses, um, acne, it's often used in, used in uh, teenagers for acne. And you can also use it for patients who have peptic ulcer disease caused by Helicobacter pylori. pylori. Um, when it comes to the different drug types, we have short, intermediate, and long-acting tetracyclines. You're going to learn tetracycline and doxycycline. Doxycycline is a bit of a special drug um, because not only does it attack bacteria, but it can actually also attack certain types of malaria. So there are going to be certain malaria strains that you can use doxycycline to prevent infection and also treat infection with, from the malaria. They can all give, be given PO, and they're going to be absorbed better on an empty stomach. They're all bound with calcium supplements, magnesium, iron, basically any metal supplement. So what you want to do is you want to give them away from milk, um, and you want to give them away from um, also from antacids and multivitamins and all that sort of thing. And you can read the rest of the slide. Tetracyclines can all cause GI upset. Basically, they can make your stomach feel like it's burning. It can cause pain, cramps, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, all the good stuff. Um, in younger people, they can cause discoloration of teeth. Um, they can cause hypoplasia of enamel. So this is quite common kind of in the people who grew up in the 50s and 60s. Um, sometimes they would have just kind of yellowed teeth because of tetracycline when they were young. It can also suppress long bone growth in premature infants. Um, thing about photosensitivity, um, it can range from very mild to very severe. Mild would be like you go out for 30 minutes and it looks like you tanned all day. Um, a severe reaction might be you go out for 10 or 15 minutes with SPF 50 sunscreen on and not only does it cause a sunburn, but it also causes a rash. Macrolides are a class of, um, of antibiotic that binds to the 
ribosomal subunit again, but this time it's going to be 50S. They're broad spectrum. They all cause adverse GI effects. Primarily, it's going to speed up the gut and cause um, diarrhea. Erythromycin, clarithromycin, and azithromycin are the three brand name or three drug names. Erythromycin is oldest, and it takes a lot of drug dose to get therapeutic effect. And all of these drugs have more of the GI uh, GI adverse effect the higher the dose. So erythromycin isn't going to be quite as effective as some of the others because you're going to have less side effect at effective doses. Um, azithromycin is probably the most commonly prescribed one, and its brand name is Zithromax, and the most common form of Zithromax is known as the z -Pak. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. You can see some of the uses for erythromycin here. Um, erythromycin and the other macrolides are also used as an alternative to penicillin for patients who have allerg allergy to penicillin. Um, so basically, if a patient has strep pneumo infection, or if they have py um, strep pyogenes, or if they have ear infections, you could use erythromycin instead of penicillin. You can read all this, I just want to mention one thing. Erythromycin is sometimes used for its off-label use, um, or sometimes used off-label for its adverse effect. So erythromycin actually speeds up how fast the gut goes, just a little bit. And so in a patient who has gastroparesis, sometimes you'll see that erythromycin is prescribed 200 milligrams four times a day with meals and at night. And when you see it prescribed like that, it's not being prescribed as an antibiotic. In this case, it's being prescribed as a prokinetic. Azithromycin and clarithromycin are both used for um, pneumonia and atypical pneumonia, as well as everything you can use erythromycin for. Azithromycin, its claim to fame is that you take it for five days and it stays in your body for up to ten. You can actually double up and take two pills a day and be done in three days. The problem is you're going to double up on the side effects as well. Um, but it'll still last in your body for three for ten days. Clorithromycin um, has a metallic taste as an adverse effect, but other than that, it's very similar to the others. Clindamycin binds to the 50S sub, uh, subunit of the ribosome, and it is extremely broad spectrum. It's going to kill most aerobes, whether gram positive or negative, and most gram-positive anaerobes. So it's going to be highly associated with pseudomembranous colitis. It's not as widely used today because of the sever potential severity of colitis, but it used to be used very, very commonly. And it used to be the drug of choice for patients who had penicillin allergy. Now that's going to be a macrolide instead of clindamycin. If you have a patient who's going to receive clindamycin, it's probably a good idea, or really any antibiotic therapy, it's probably a good idea to have them take some probiotic, even if it's just eating some live cultured yogurt. Now, the research shows that that kind of low-dose probiotic isn't that helpful, but anything is better than nothing. And it's just yogurt. Alternatively, they can take some probiotic capsules. One thing to note with clindamycin is that just because a patient has clindamycin does not mean they're actually going to get C. diff. And it's usually not just one round of clindamycin that causes it. Usually it's the patient was on one antibiotic and it kind of cleared it, but not enough. And then they went on another antibiotic and now they're put on clindamycin or they're put on clindamycin two or three times because they didn't quite clear the infection. That's when the patients are more likely to get C. diff. Although it is possible that anyone can get C. diff on one round of any antibiotic. Next we have lenizolid or Zyvox. The key here is that it can work on MRSA and VRE, vancomycin resistant enterococcus. Um, it only works on gram positive bacteria and it can cause nausea, diarrhea. When you give it orally, 
the pill has phenylalanine in it, which means that patients who have PKU should not take the oral form. They should only have the IV form. It can cause some myelosuppression, so it can reduce the amount of red blood cells uh, growth, cause, and cause some anemia, and there's mild MAO inhibition. So remember that MAO stands for monoamine oxidase, and it's the enzyme that breaks down epinephrine and norepinephrine. So our patients are going to be at risk for norepinephrine toxicity. So we're going to do two things. We're going to have them avoid sympathomimetics and other central nervous system stimulants such as caffeine. So no caffeine, no, um, no pseudoephedrine or phenylephrine. And we're going to avoid tyramine foods. So tyramine is the precursor to norepinephrine. So if you have too much tyramine, that can potentially increase the amount of norepinephrine that you have. Tyramine foods include um, uh, dark chocolate, well, just chocolate, chocolate, aged cheeses, wine, and beer. So, takes all the fun out of life. You can read the slide for chloramphenicol. We're not going to really learn about dalfopristin or quindipristin or spectinomycin or tolithromycin. We're going to skip all the way down to mupirocin or bactroban. It's an ointment and it can work on MRSA. That's pretty cool, huh? Um, besides being used as a general antibiotic for topical infections, you can also use it for MRSA colonization and it's the drug of choice for patients who have burns but are allergic to sylvidine. The aminoglycosides are interesting drugs. They are bac um, bacterial inhibit or protein synthesis inhibitors, but the way that they work actually causes them to become bactericidal rather than bacteriostatic. They're very narrow spectrum. They primarily work on gram-negative bacilli, and they cannot kill anaerobes. They can only kill aerobes. They're also highly polar, which means they can't cross the blood-brain barrier, and they also can't be absorbed in the GI tract. They are rapidly excreted by the kidneys, and that can lead to nephrotoxicity. The way that aminoglycosides work is by mimicking nucleotides. So um, what's going to happen is as the, ribos as the uh, messenger RNA is going through the ribosome and matching up the transfer RNAs, it's going to cause errors in transcription translation. So the, those translation error, errors are going to end up causing um, proteins that are bad. And the more bad proteins are produced can actually end up killing the, back, the cell. There's also something called the post-antibiotic effect, which is that aminoglycosides can continue killing the bacteria even after their blood levels go below um, therapeutic. Most of the time when you give an aminoglycoside you're going to be giving it IV and that's going to be for infections such as Pseudomonas or Enterobacter. You can also use them PO but only for the local effects. So the most common reason you'd give them PO is as a prep for bowel surgery. So before you do operations on the intestines, you want to reduce the amount of bacteria that are in the gut. And so aminoglycosides are like perfect for that. You give it to the PO, there's no side effects, it doesn't get absorbed, it only works on the bacteria in the gut. And then finally you can use neomycin, better known as neosporin, for topical infections. And then gentamicin and tobramycin both come in ophthalmic formulations for treatment of eyes. You can read the slide here. When it comes to adverse effects, sototoxicity is the first one we're going to talk about. And what we used to do is we used to give them on a relatively frequent basis. And we tried to keep the therapeutic level 
you know, fairly stable. Now what that did is it gave a fairly high trough level compared to giving the drug less often with a higher dose. So here you see the trough level is much lower. What causes ototoxicity is that high trough level. The way that we can prevent toxicity is you're going to give fewer doses, but bigger doses. Um, there's two forms of ototoxicity. One is cochlear, which is reduced hearing. Tinnitus, ringing in the ears, is going to be the usually the first thing you're going to get. And then also hearing decline. When it comes to vestibular damage, that's associated with balance and that can cause headache, nausea, and vertigo. Think about being car sick or reading in the car. When it comes to nephrotoxicity or the kidney, that's going to be associated with the total cumulative dose. So what you have to do is you have to limit the total amount of dose by just stopping the drug after a certain dose level. And it can also cause neuromuscular blockade. When it comes to interactions, we already mentioned that when you mix penicillin with aminoglycosides, you get um, a precipitate, so don't do that. And of course, if you mix them with drugs that can cause autotoxicity or nephrotoxicity, you increase the risk of any of that. And because of the potential neuromuscular blocks, uh, blockade, musculoskeletal muscle relaxants will also interact with Read the slide. Genomycin is probably the cheapest one, but it's also the one that has the most resistance against it. Um, tobramycin is more active against Pseudomonas, less against Enterobacter. There's an inhaled version that you can use for cystic fibrosis. And then Genomycin and Tobramycin both come in, in um, ophthalmic ointments that can be used for conjunctivitis and other eye problems. And then amikacin has the broadest action and so least likely to be inactivated. Sulfonamides are actually the first antibiotics that we discovered, um, not penicillin. But the reason why penicillin gets all the press is because, well, the first sulfonamides were terrible. They didn't work that well in terms of killing bacteria, and they had huge numbers of side effects. Um, as a result of that, they just didn't work. We didn't use them. Um, <clears throat> nowadays, there's only a couple that we use, and we usually use them in combination with other drugs at the same time. Um, anyway, the way that sulfonamides work is that they mimic PABA, which is a component of folic acid, and is used by bacteria to um, synthesize DNA. So by pretending to be PABA, it's going to inhibit the uh, bacteria's ability to make new bacteria. Nowadays, UTI is the primary indication for most sulfonamides, and really there's only one that we use for that. Okay, sulfonamides can cause renal, dam uh, renal damage. The older ones were worse. The newer ones are better, but they still have some potential side effects. The most severe side effect is something called Steven Johnson syndrome, which can actually occur with any sulfur drug, sulfa drug. So any drug that has a sulfa group in it has the potential to cause Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Um, if there's a 25% mortality associated with it and you get systemic epithelial lesions, it usually starts off as red dots on the skin. Um, and then as soon as that occurs, patients just stop taking the drug. Um, basically what happens in this, in this situation is that there's going to be epithelial sloughing all over the body. So if you ever had a sunburn or see someone with a sunburn and the skin just kind of starts peeling away, that's sloughing. So in this case, there's going to be epithelial sloughing in the skin, inside the mouth, inside the eyelids, um, inside the bronchi, inside the gut, um, inside the urethra, basically everywhere. And that can lead to life threat and that can lead to death. The treatment, uh, the treatment is primarily going to be stop the drug and give anti-inflammatory drugs, primarily steroids.
there's basically only two drugs that we're using these days. Um, one is sulfamethoxazole. You need to drink it with lots of water. And it's really only used in combination with another drug called trimethoprim. So we'll talk about that one in a second. The other drug that we use is called silver sulfadiazine, better known as silvadine. And the sulfadiazine actually doesn't really do anything. It's just kind of a delivery mechanism. The main way the drug works is by silver ions, which inhibit bacterial growth. It comes as a, an ointment, kind of like a very luxurious feeling Crisco type ointment. And it's often used for patients who have burns. If a burn patient is allergic to, to uh, sulfa drugs, then remember Bactroban or Mupiracin is the drug of choice. Trimethoprim is not a sulfonamide, but what it does is it inhibits the, the step in, uh, in uh, folic acid synthesis right after PABA. So it's hardly ever given by itself. It's almost always given in combination with sulfamethoxazole because when you give the two drugs together, they inhibit much better than if you give one by itself. So that combination sometimes is abbreviated as TMP-SMZ and it goes under the brand name Septra or Bactrim, and it is the drug of choice for treating uncomplicated urinary tract infections. Um, it also can be used to treat or to prevent pneumocystis carinae, which is um, a protozoa that can cause pneumonia in immunocompromised patients. Just a diagram of sulfonamides block this step, Trimethoprim blocks this step, so when you give them together, it works better than if you give one by itself. Next we have fluoroquinolones. They are very broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, they can be used to treat almost anything. Pneumonia, UTI, sinusitis, skin infections, bone infections, I mean you name it, they can probably treat it. Um, the way they work is by inhibiting bacterial DNA gyrase, blah blah blah. Um, as far as adverse effects go, they can cause GI reactions, dizziness, headache, fatigue, and a weird thing is tendon rupture. So if the patient is getting tendon pain, they should actually stop taking it immediately. Most common in young people, um, it's quite rare. There are some people who say that it's so rare as to be statistically non-significant. They say that there's no reason to have it in, you know, have, even have it on there at all but it happens often enough that it needs to stay there. Um, and in fact, I know a couple people who've had tendon ruptures while they were on fluoroquinolones. Now, whether it caused it or whether it was a coincidence, who knows, but it happened. So really it doesn't hurt anything to tell patients, look, while you're on this drug, take it easy, don't run, do some swimming or do something else to exercise while you're, do while you're on this drug. And it is the Achilles tendon that's most likely to rupture here. Fluoroquinolones are highly bound to, um, to uh, metals such as aluminum, magnesium, iron, zinc, etc. So you want to give them on an empty stomach two hours before or six hours after a meal or anything with those potential those potential metals such as a calcium supplement or an antacid the true drugs that we're going to learn um, for your test are ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin this is uh, cipro for short was the um, was the first one that was discovered and it also has the most resistance to it so it's the one that doesn't work on as many things but it's very commonly used because it still works for UTI type things. Levofloxacin or Leviquin can be used for everything Cipro can, plus it can also be used for other things like skin infections or um, pneumonia. Next we have metronidazole or flagyl. It's a miscellaneous kind of drug. It um, disrupts DNA and it only works on anaerobes. Um, and it can actually work on some protozoa as well. 
Um, so we can use it for anaerobic infections, such as like if there's an infection inside a patient's gut or so, you know, somewhere in the patient. We can also use it for C. diff, and we can also use it for GI surgeries. As far as adverse effects goes, very, very common adverse effect, adverse effect is a metallic taste in the mouth. You can't get rid of it by, you know, drinking water or, you know, holding your breath while you take the, take the medication or getting an IV medication instead of a pill. Because the reason that you're having that taste is that the drug is actually coming out of, you know, the blood in your tongue and oozing up from the, from the tongue itself. Um, so you pretty much have to live with that metallic taste as long as you're on the drug. The other thing is that there can be an interaction with alcohol and it can make a patient vomiting sick. So don't drink alcohol while you're taking this medication. Um, one other thing to note is that uh, flagyl is also the drug of choice for bacterial vaginosis, which is similar to a yeast infection, but it's an overgrowth of bacteria instead of an overgrowth of yeast. It can also be used for um, rosacea on the face. Okay, daptomycin is a new drug. Yay, new drugs. Um, it has no drug class. It's the only one in its class, I guess you could say. And the way that it works is by drilling into the cell wall and then creating pores that allow potassium to exit. Um, because it works by penetrating cell walls, it only works on gram positives because gram negatives have a cell wall that's harder to penetrate. Um, it works on MRSA and VRSA, which is vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Um, so at this time, there's basically nothing, you know, no gram positive that we know of that is resistant to it. Um, as far as adverse effects, it has all the usual suspects, nausea, vomiting, headache, all that kind of stuff. But in high doses, it's associated with myopathy, which is going to be muscle breakdown. So it could potentially cause rhabdomyolysis, although supposedly in the therapeutic uses we're using today, which are lower than the ones they used during the uh, clinical trials, that we're safe and we shouldn't have myopathy. But it is a concern. All right, let's briefly talk about UTI drugs. Um, UTI is the most common infection in the United States. 25 to 35% of women have one per year, blah, 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 blah. 30 to 50% in nursing homes have UTIs. In the elderly, UTIs can actually cause um, confusion. So sometimes we think the patient's um, Alzheimer's disease is getting worse, but in fact, what it is is they have a UTI. Um, UTIs can vary by location. You can see some different locations there. Um, pyelonephritis is actually all the way up in the kidney itself. Um, prostatitis only occurs in men. One of the things we want to distinguish between is complicated versus uncomplicated. So complicated um, infections are going to be infections where the patient has had either they are immunosuppressed or they've had recent surgery in that area or instrumentation. Now, instrumentation is a weird kind of word, and it basically means any instruments that have been placed in that area, the most common of which would be a urinary catheter. So if they've had surgery in the urinary tract, or if they've had a urinary catheter or a scope of some kind, then it's considered complicated, or if they're immunosuppressed. Otherwise, it's uncomplicated. The vast majority in, you know, of UTIs are gonna be uncomplicated. Most of the complicated ones are going to occur in the hospital. So it's going to change the way that we treat UTIs depending on which one. About 80% of infections are E. coli. So basically um, bacteria from the GI tract is being whooshed, smushed, driven, carried something into the urinary tract. Um, the, other, um, the other part is going to be uh, gram-positive cocci and then occasionally something else. In the hospital setting, E. coli is only about 50% of the time. Um, now there are some urinary tract antiseptics such as um, macrodantin and those are really only for uncomplicated lower tract. So remember complicated versus uncomplicated.
The drug of choice for uncomplicated, though, is going to be Septra, um, double strength, twice a day for three days. So, Septra, double strength, twice a day for three days. Um, if the patient is allergic to sulfa, then um, a fluoroquinolone is the, sec is the next in line, and ciprofloxacin is probably the most common. If the patient has a complicated infection, in that case, you're going to want to get a urinary, um, sorry, you're going to want to get a urinary um, culture and sensitivity and then treat whatever is cultured out. Okay, mycobacterium. The only one I'm really going to talk about in any detail is tuberculosis. Um, tuberculosis is a mycobacterium. It's a very slow growing disease and the reason why is um, your body attacks it and then the macrophages eat the bacteria and then instead of killing it they make friends with it so it actually lives inside of the um, macrophages now after a little while the immune system is going to kick into gear and it's going to tell those macrophages hey you need to get rid of your little friend there you need to kill it and most of the macrophages are going to do that and so most of the time, 90% of the time, patients who have um, tuberculosis never have any symptoms at all. But they still have the potential to transmit the disease to someone else because they still do have a little bit of the bacteria still in them. So it's important that we treat patients even if they are asymptomatic because they could still potentially transmit the disease to someone else. The tuberculosis bacteria is quite fragile and most of the time is um, not viable outside of, the outside of the human body for very long. So catching it is a little bit difficult. So most of the time the people who are most at risk are people who live or work in close proximity with patients who have tuberculosis. So um, at the highest risk you're going to find people who live in prisons or live family members who live with um, tuberculosis family members. <clears throat> One thing to note is that um, immunosuppression is also a risk factor. So HIV AIDS patients and cancer patients are also at higher risk of getting tuberculosis. Most of the tuberculosis bacteria now is um, resistant to at least one drug. Some are resistant to multiple drugs. So we're never going to treat a patient with just one drug. We're going to treat them with multiple drugs. Um, each of the drugs, isoniazid, rifampin, fenbutol, uh, streptomycin, etc., all of those drugs have an interesting side effect or two, and on your test you might just have a question matching side effects to individual drugs. Um, tuberculosis um, treatment regimes can, or regimens can um, range from about two months up to a year and a half or two years in patients with multi-drug resistant uh, tuberculosis and HIV or other immunosuppression. Okay, now we're moving to antifungals. Um, we're going to differentiate between opportunistic and non-opportunistic um, infections. Opportunistic infections are infections in patients that um, that have had um, an alteration in the normal flora on the patient's body, etc. Um, there's only really one drug that's truly, truly effective for systemic antifungals right now, and that's amphotericin B. It is highly toxic to humans. It's very broad spectrum, so it works on a lot of different fungus. And this is a good choice for most systemic mycoses, which is the fancy name for fungal infections. Um, it has a couple nasty side effects, including malaise, not making you feel very good. So we're going to pre-medicate the patient with um, acetaminophen, and it also has infusion reactions and renal toxicity. Um, to test for an infusion reaction, you're going to give the patient a test dose. If the patient reacts, then you might not give the rest of it. You'll need to call the doctor and find out what they want to do. Um, the purpose of the test dose is to see if there's an infusion reaction. Um, the drug can also lead to hypokalemia. It does have the nickname Amphoterrible. If you put down the word Amphoterrible on a quiz or a test, you will not get credit. You need to put Amphotericin B.
Next, we have the azole antifungals, ketoconazole, itraconazole, myconazole, clotrimazole, fluconazole, voriconazole, and econazole. The ones that have asterisks next to them can be used systemically as well as topically. Um, sorry, not all of them can be used topically, um, but they can definitely be used systemically. Um, all of them are strong inhibitors of the cytochrome P450 system and have significant drug interactions. Um, they are generally safer than amphotericin B, however, they might not be as effective for systemic mycoses. Um, they're more often used for um, superficial mycoses. When used systemically, they do have the potential to cause hepatotoxicity, so you should get liver function tests before and after their use. Topically, they are some of the drugs of choice for, for treating topical infections, which we'll talk about in a little bit in another slide. Okay, now we're going to talk about some superficial mycoses. Superficial is going to be in three major places. We're going to have um, the skin, we're going to have the vagina, and the mouth. So those are the three main places that we consider it to be superficial. Um, as part of skin, you can also include nails. Nails are special because of their um, hardened keratinic nature. They're much harder to treat than any other type of, of um, fungal infection. So when it comes to the skin, we have, we're going to name it differently depending on where it occurs. So on the head, capitis. On the body, corporis. In the groin, crurus. And on the foot, pedis. Um, and you can see some of the drugs of choice here. For the hair, uh, sorry, for the head, uh, tinea capitis, typically you'd use ketoconazole shampoo, 2%. Um, it doesn't really work that well because it doesn't get that much, that high of a concentration to the actual fungus. So usually what they would do is either shave the patient's head and then use topical, or um, they can um, use a systemic. But if you don't want to use either of those, you can try the ketoconazole shampoo. For tinea corporis, um, typically you're going to use an azole antifungal or terbinafine. And um, this is sometimes known as ringworm because what it will look like is it'll look like a round lesion that has kind of like a kind of fades in toward the middle. So it looks like a ring. In addition to terbinafine or lamisil, there is a newer drug called butenafine or Lotrimin Ultra that is also available, and it's in the same class as terbinafine. Tinea cruris or jock itch, same thing, topical azole antifungal, or you can use um, terbinafine or, or butenafine or uh, terbinafine. Same with tinea pedis, athlete's foot, you use a topical azole antifungal or lamisil, um, terbinafine or butenafine. Um, all of these are fairly similar, all the tinea corporis, cruris, and pedis. It's just a matter of how long it takes to treat them. Typically, treating the feet is going to take longer than it will take to treat um, tinea corporis, and kind of tinea cruris is a, a little bit in the middle. The problem with treating tinea pedis is that, you know, if you wear shoes at all, you typically have a moist, dry, uh, sorry, a moist, dark environment, which is perfect for growing fungus. You do need to take some care because you can spread the fungus from the feet to the to the groin or from the groin to the feet. So you, if you have athlete's foot, you want to put your socks on before you put your underwear on. And if you have jock itch, if you have um, tinea cruris, you want to do the opposite. You want to um, put your underwear on. Sorry, you want to take your underwear off after. Sorry, take your socks off after you take your underwear off. When it comes to candidiasis, candidiasis can be on the skin, or it can be in the vagina, or it can be in the mouth. Um, so for vulvovaginal, which so we just call a yeast infection, typically you're going to use a local azole antifungal. Um, you can get them over the counter, things like monostat. Um, it's basically just clotrimazole. Um, you can also use oral fluconazole for that purpose. Um, oral fluconazole, the brand name is Diflucan, and its claim to fame is that it can treat most vulvovaginal yeast infections with just one dose. Um, if it's not enough, then you can give them a second dose. When it comes to oral candidiasis, it's known as thrush, you've got a couple different options. You can use Nystatin, um, 
which comes as a mouthwash. And you can also use clotrimazole, which comes as a truche, uh, which is a vulvovaginal vaginal um, suppository. Don't tell the patient that's what it is, and we'll all be happy. In more severe cases, you can use oral fluconazole, which typically would be um, a seven-day course of fluconazole. And finally, on onychomycosis, which is fungal infection of the nails, the preferred agent is oral lamicil, terbinafine, and you're going to have to take that for about three months, which is about how long it takes to regrow nails. Alternatively, you could remove the nail and then just use a topical antifungal as the nail regrows. One thing to note is that as a nurse or even a nursing student, people will ask you how to treat these types of infections and you should <clears throat> be able to tell them general information even if you're not telling them what they should do in general for, for athletes, but you should do this and then let them make their own decision. Okay, Christia Fulvin has been removed from the market, so you can ignore that very first line. The only thing I'm going to talk about here is Nystatin, just a little bit in more detail. <clears throat> Nystatin is available as a powder, and it's also available as a mouthwash. It can be used for candidiasis, usually. Okay, next thing we're going to talk about is antivirals. The first antiviral is acyclovir and valacyclovir. They are active against um, herpes simplex. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk briefly about herpes simplex. It comes in two forms, herpes simplex 1 and herpes simplex 2. Herpes simplex 1 is known as oral herpes and causes fever blisters and cold sores around the mouth and nose. Herpes simplex 2 is sometimes known as genital herpes and is a sexually transmitted disease. It causes much more severe, it causes similar um, sores, but in the genital area, and they are more severe than the ones associated with type 1, the herpes simplex 1. Herpes simplex 2 can be transmitted from the genital area to the mouth, and I'll let you guess how that happens, and there it can cause more severe problems in the face. Um, herpes simplex 2, 1 and 2, both of them attack the nerve cells, which is why they cause um, numbness and tingling and burning sensation. When it attacks the, the um, nerves in the face, sometimes it will actually cause um, ophthalmic or optic herpes, where it's infecting the um, nerves that innervate the eye. And that can be what, um, not life-threatening, but it can be um, vision threatening and can cause permanent blindness in the eye that it affects. So acyclovir is available as a topical um, cream that you can use for cold sores. It's also available in oral form and IV. It is very, very, very poorly absorbed orally. Um, so for a long time it was the only drug we had and so what you'd have to do is you'd have to bring patients in to the into the hospital and give them IV um, acyclovir if you wanted to treat their herpes. What we have now is we have a prodrug which is called val acyclovir. So val acyclovir is absorbed better in the GI tract and then in the body it turns into acyclovir. So by giving the pill you can actually get IV levels of acyclovir which is very helpful. Um, so we no longer have to bring patients in and give them IV in order to get these um, high doses of acyclovir into the patient's body. Acyclovir is, um, has three basic uses when it comes to herpes. The first one is it can treat individual outbreaks. In order for it to be effective, you want to give it as early as possible in the infection. So as soon as the patient feels any tingling or um, burning sensation, even before a lesion occurs, that's the best time to take the acyclovir. You can also use acyclovir to suppress um, recurrent infections. So the definition of recurrent is usually four or more outbreaks in a year. So if a patient is having four or more outbreaks in a year, they might want to consider going on a valley acyclovir all the time. The last um, use for it is for suppression of viral shedding because patients can actually shed the herpes virus even when there's no lesion. So you can use the drug to prevent the shedding and reduce the risk of transmitting herpes to a partner.
using it in this manner is not a substitute for informing a partner that you actually have genital herpes if you have herpes. Gancyclovir is used for cytomegalovirus, also known as CMV. CMV is really only a problem in immunosuppressed patients, such as patients who have HIV or who have, um, sorry, HIV AIDS, or who have um, organ transplants, um, also cancer patients. It has to, have, has to be given in very, very large doses because it's very poorly um, absorbed, and it has some potentially severe side effects, such as um, granulocytopenia, where it destroys the granulocytes in the body, such as neutrophils, or thrombocytopenia, where it destroys platelets in the body. Um, you have the same problem as with acyclovir. It's very poorly absorbed in the GI tract. So there is also a prodrug form of this called valgancyclovir. So it gets much higher um, blood levels into the body by giving a PO drug. Okay, next we're going to talk about hepatitis B and C. Um, so briefly, let's just talk about the three different main types of hepatitis. So hepatitis A, B, and C. Hepatitis A is what's called orofecal route. So it's transmitted by infected feces coming into contact with a person's oral mucosa. Uh, the most common reason for transmission is infected water supply. Um, so it's not that common in the United States, but you can get it in other ways, such as direct contact, um, contact with children who don't wash their hands, etc. Um, you can also get it from chewing the back of people's pen caps and then lending them to people. Um, hepatitis A is almost always um, acute. It does not go chronic that we know of. So that's pretty much, and there is a, a, a vaccine that is effective for hepatitis A. So it's recommended that people get the vaccine. Hepatitis B is primarily sexually transmitted. It is considered a sexually transmitted disease. It's also considered a blood-borne pathogen, which means you can get it by direct blood, con blood, uh, direct blood contact. Um, so the most common re uh, way of transmitting it there is going to be either sharing needles with drug use or um, healthcare professionals who get stuck with an infected needle. 10% um, of patients who have infection will go on to become chronic. So almost everyone gets you know, a two to uh, two month bad hepatitis infection and then they get better but 10% of them will go on to be chronic and they'll actually be able to transmit the virus throughout their entire lives. There is an effective vaccine and it's recommended that everyone get it. In the state of Florida you have to get it before you can go into the, into the seventh grade so around age 12. Um, it's also recommended that all healthcare workers get it because of the potential for needle sticks. And that brings us to hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is um, primarily bloodborne pathogen, so sharing needles and um, needle sticks in healthcare workers. Um, for a while, it was being transmitted through tattoos, and the main re they thought it was through needles, so everyone got a new needle, plus we had to do that for HIV anyway. And then it turned out that we were still transmitting the virus through tattoos. And it turned out that it was living in the ink wells. So now everyone gets their own ink when they get a tattoo. Um, hepatitis C can have an acute illness, although you, the acute illness is usually less severe than A or B. But almost always, it's going to move on to become a chronic illness and eventually cause liver failure. It is the number one um, cause of liver cancer in the United States. So as far as the drugs go, interferon alpha can be used for both hepatitis B and C. Um, it's a family of, interferons are a family of naturally occurring immunomodulators, and they, produ they produce flu-like symptoms in patients who receive them. Um, they also can cause depression, fatigue, alopecia, blood disorders, thyroid dysfunction, a huge number of problems. Um, usually it's used in combination with ribavirin, and you always want to use more than one drug when you're treating hepatitis C. 
what you're trying to do is you're trying to reduce the number of viruses in the patient's blood and that number is called viral load so a viral load is the number of viral replications in a given amount of blood um, the goal of therapy is to bring viral load as low as possible and ideally bring it down to zero if it stays at zero after the drugs are removed that is called a sustained viral response um, it's not necessarily cured it can come back later but it's a very good sign that the hepatitis C is under control and the patient's body is winning at least at that point in time um, treatment with interferon and ribavirin is um, quite intensive you have to be treated for somewhere between six months to a year uh, minimum for it to work and because of the depression um, a lot of patients will actually go off the medication regimen because of that so before a patient can begin um, treatment with hepatitis C drugs they have to have a, a psychiatric profile and they're gonna look at their risk of depression they're gonna look at their psychiatric illnesses they're gonna look at their social support social support network because when a patient feels bad and they feel like killing themselves if they don't have good friends and family there's a good chance they actually might do so it will also help reduce the risk of um, patients failing because they just decide to go off the drug there are some newer drugs out there that are much safer and you're going to be having to read um, an article or watch a little um, news release about some of those things now the newer drugs are much safer and they are also um, work in a much shorter amount of time so some of the newer drugs they have can get a sustained viral response in as little as 12 weeks which is about three months for those of you who are bad at math so rather than having to be treated for six months to a year and have all of the horrible psych psychiatric um, side effects as well as the other things um, the newer drugs are much more well tolerated and they work faster and better however they're more expensive one of the new drugs is an experimental drug right now costs about twelve hundred dollars a pill naturally you take a pill a day so it's going to cost about ninety thousand dollars to treat a patient for three months our last topic for this uh, for this test is influenza now the reason that we care about influenza is because of the Spanish um, flu epidemic of 1918 it was at the tail end of World War II oh, sorry World War I and it killed a huge number of people worldwide and what made it worse than most flu epidemics is most flus have a tendency to kill patients who are very young or very old and typically ones who are already sick um, typically if you're a young healthy person then even if you get the flu it's not that big a deal sure it doesn't feel good it's terrible you're out of work um, you wish you were dead but it doesn't kill you However, with the Spanish flu epidemic, for a variety of reasons, the youngest, the youngest, healthiest people, not youngest, but the young, healthiest people were the ones who were most likely to die from it. Today, the CDC tells us that somewhere about 36 or 38,000 people die each year from the flu. However, that number is a little bit inflated because anyone who's had flu-like symptoms who dies is said to have the flu and died of the flu even though they may have died of something else um, some estimates put the actual number of flu related illnesses where people actually die from flu at about two to three thousand a year now it doesn't mean you know it's not as bad as 36,000 but it can still kill you and it is a concern and the people who are most likely to die again are the very young the very old and the ones who are already sick so let's talk a little bit about the vaccine um, the flu vaccine consists of the three most common strains from the year before it's reformulated every year and what they do is they take the three most common strains from last year's epidemic or last year's flu season and then they put it into this year's vaccine sometimes they guess very well sometimes they guess very poorly as it turns out this particular flu season they chose very poorly and the flu vaccine is only going to cover about 25 percent of the flu cases that we have this year so 75 percent of the people who get the flu they're not going to be cut or exposed to the flu they're not going to be covered by the flu vaccine at all now one thing to be aware of when it comes to this three most common the CDC doesn't monitor the entire country they only monitor the hundred largest cities in the United States and then they don't necessarily um, 
test every person who comes into the doctor with flu-like illnesses. It's just the ones who happen to get tested, that's the ones that get reported. So there's a lot of room for error in that system. Now, the next, um, the next line on the slide says that coverage lasts from two weeks to six months. Now, when we say coverage, we don't necessarily mean that you're immune. What we mean is that there are antibodies produced in large enough numbers for us to consider you to have responded to the vaccine. Um, so um, in a large number of cases, people are going to get start producing antibodies within two weeks, and then those antibody coverage or antibody production will last up to about six months. On average, though, it's going to be somewhere between three to four months. Now, the flu season lasts for six months. So someone who gets a flu uh, vaccine very early in the year might not be covered later in the flu vaccine. Um, 70 to 90% of young adults become immune. With the elderly, it's much less, um, much less of them actually seroconvert and become, start producing antibodies. And if they do produce antibodies, the amount of antibodies and the duration of the antibody production is also lower. There are two major forms of the, inje of the uh, influenza vaccine. There's the intramuscular injection, and then there's the intranasal so-called flu mist. The injection uses a dead virus, and the dead virus cannot cause the flu. However, as a side effect, it can cause flu-like symptoms to occur in patients. So um, a patient who, who gets the flu vaccine might feel bad for a couple days and feel like they have the flu. They might get, be a little bit achy, might have a low-grade fever, um, just kind of feel bad. But they don't actually have the flu. They just have a reaction to the, to the vaccine. You can tell them, that's how you know the vaccine is working. Unfortunately, it can impact job performance and school performance. Um, a couple years ago, we actually had a mass um, student flu vaccine day the day before a test. And then the next day during the test, about half the class felt like they had the flu because of that side effect. So just be aware that it can happen. Um, there's also risk of fainting um, within 30 minutes of getting the flu vaccine administered. So ideally, after you get the flu vaccine, you should sit down for about 30 minutes to make sure that you're not going to faint. The intranasal uh, vaccine, it's called Flumist, uses a live virus and supposedly the person who's being immune immunized cannot actually get the vaccine, cannot get the flu from the vaccine. However, people who are around that patient might be able to get the flu as the virus is being shed from that patient's nose. So the moral of the story is, if you're doing this with kids, they should get it on a Friday after school and they should not be around friends and, um, or they should not be around friends until at least Monday. Um, the other thing is if you're going to have one family member get the, this flu mist, the entire family should get the flu mist or else a family member might be able to get the uh, flu from the, from their family member who got the flu mist vaccine. And then finally, we have some anti-influenza drugs. Um, first generation had fairly low activity. They had high resistance. They didn't work that well. And they really only worked against what's called type A flu. Um, type A flu, fortunately, is the one that is more severe and the symptoms are worse. So at least it worked against the one that was worse. Um, type B flu is not quite as common and the vaccine, sorry, and the illness is usually not quite as severe as type A. The newer um, drugs, they're called neuraminidase inhibitors, those have more activity against the flu, there's less resistance, and they work on both type A and type B. So if you've ever heard of Tamiflu, Tamiflu is one of those neuraminidase inhibitors. Um, the thing about these is that none of them will actually make the flu last, or make the flu last a shorter time. They don't decrease the duration of the flu. They don't cure the flu. All they do is reduce the symptoms of the flu and make the patient feel a little bit better. Finally, a couple of factors that can um, make the flu worse. The first one is vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D deficiency is highly associated with more severe illnesses when it comes to flu and, um, infection. The other thing is uh, patients should never, ever, ever get aspirin when they have the flu. 
Aspirin in combination with viral illnesses, and particularly the flu, but also ones like chickenpox, can cause a neurological illness called RISE syndrome. And in children, that can cause permanent retardation. Um, most, one of the theories behind why the Spanish flu epidemic was as bad as it was, was that there was, um, you know, they were using aspirin widely at that time as an anti-fever agent. And so when people got the flu, they took aspirin because that's what you do for a fever. Um, the other thing is that because of World War I, there was a lot of trench warfare, there was a lot of malnutrition going on, so patients weren't as healthy in general. And then the other thing is lack of vitamin D from trench warfare. Uh, that doesn't necessarily explain the people back in the United States who died from it, but it does help to understand why young, otherwise healthy soldiers might be more at risk of dying. Okay, the last thing is just um, an illustration of vaccine effectiveness. Um, this is actually, these numbers are adapted from an article. Um, you can see the article at the bottom if you're interested in following up on it. Um, I've made the numbers a little bit cleaner so that the math works out easier, but otherwise the numbers are fairly much what they are. So there are basically a thousand people in the vaccine group. So a thousand people got the vaccine. A thousand people thought they got the vaccine, but didn't actually get it. In the vaccine group, 20 got the flu that season, and in the placebo group, 30 got the flu. So you can see that the vaccine group got less incidence of the flu. So if you do out the numbers, what you're going to find is that 2% of the vaccine, got, vaccine group got the flu and 3% of the placebo group. So that tells us one thing, first of all, that the vaccine isn't perfect. You can still get the flu even if you got the vaccine. The second thing that it tells us is that there was a reduction in flu. How much of a reduction? That's the important question. And if you do what's called an absolute risk analysis, you're going to take 3% minus 2%, and that's going to give you an absolute reduction in risk of 1%. Now, that doesn't sound very impressive, does it? And to a lot of people, it doesn't sound impressive. If you tell them, your risk of getting the flu is 1% less if you get the vaccine, most people will say, no thanks. Now, let's take a look at what's called relative risk. So what we do, if we take the ratio of percents, so 2% to 3%, that would be a 33% reduction. Sorry, um, it would be 66%, but when you subtract it out from 100%, that would give you 33% reduction in flu. So if I told you that your risk of getting the flu is a third less, well, that sounds 33% less, that sounds a lot better than your risk was 1% lower. Um, so some of that is just marketing. The last thing that we would like to know is what's called the number needed to treat. So we had 30 people who got the flu, who would have gotten the flu anyway. And then in the treatment group, we had 20 people who got the flu. So that is a difference of 10 people. So if we, so in our study, we saved 10 cases of the flu. Now to save those 10 cases, we had to treat 1,000 participants. So we're gonna take that 1,000 right there and divide it by the number of cases that we saved and that's gonna come out to be 100. So basically, we have to treat 100 people in order to save one case of flu. Now, this is with, um, you know, you have to look at the population that the study was done in. Was this done in high-risk patients? Was it done in ordinary healthy patients? If you're a patient who has asthma, who has COPD, who has immunosuppression, it's probably a good idea for you to go ahead and get the vaccine. Um, if you're otherwise a young, healthy person who doesn't have vitamin D deficiency, then the benefits are not nearly as clear. Your chances of getting the flu are already extremely low. Even if you're diagnosed with the flu, we know that a lot of the time what you actually have was just some other illness that had flu-like symptoms. I mean, imagine all of the exotic diseases in the world that say flu-like symptoms. Malaria, flu-like symptoms. Dengue fever, flu-like symptoms. Well, there are a huge number of just regular old upper respiratory viruses out there that can cause flu-like symptoms. So did you actually have the flu or did you have a flu-like illness? Um, in this particular study, they actually report three charts like this um, where they talk about this group versus that group. And one of them is with patients where they actually tested their blood. One of them is where they had symptoms of flu and the doctor 
actually diagnosed them with flu, whether they actually drew their blood or not to check. And then the third one was in self-reporting. So I feel like I have the flu. So just because someone says they have the flu doesn't mean they actually have the flu. Final take home message. A lot of times when I go through this analysis, people come away with the idea that Dr. Haven says the vaccines don't work and I shouldn't get one. And that is not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you have to weigh the risks and the benefits and make an informed decision. The vaccine does work. However, your chances of getting flu to begin with are not that high in the general population. You as a healthcare worker are going to be exposed to sick people your chances of getting the flu are probably higher than the average person's just because of that exposure. So that might make you more likely to want to get the flu vaccine. Um, the other thing you have to consider is what is your overall health and what are the risks to you if you get sick? Do you have young children, children at home? Would you, if you got sick, would you be giving them the illness or do you live by yourself or with roommates who you know, it's not a big deal if you give them the flu um, or if they bring the home flu to you, the flu home to you? Um, so it's a very complicated question, and it's, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't allow the media to grandstand one way or the other, because what is always presented in is, as vaccines are 100% effective and everyone should get them and you're crazy if you don't get them, or vaccines are evil and disgusting and is horrible and is mind control and it's going to cause Alzheimer's disease and it's going to kill you and it's going to cause autism and it's going to do all these horrible things. Maybe it might do that to a few people, but it's quite clear that overall, the vaccines seem to be fairly safe. So the question is, what are your risks of having bad effects? What are your risks of getting the flu? How bad would it be for you if you got the flu? Make your own decision. And when you have a patient, you really need to approach them in the same way. They need to be informed of the benefits and the risks to them as an individual so they can make their own decision.